This is part two of the ultimate guide to sourdough starters and sourdough baking. I am talking troubleshooting. I'm answering all of your questions you had on my last video, and we're going to make some beautiful sourdough artisan loaves with some add-ins. So I'm excited to show you this whole process. I will put timestamps in the description. So if you want to skip through all of the chit chat about troubleshooting and tips and advice and just get to baking the sourdough loaves, you can do that as well. Today I'm going to answer all of your questions about sourdough starters. We're going to talk about troubleshooting and I'll just go through all of the questions that I got on my ultimate guide to sourdough starter video. But first, I have a mess to clean up. You can see it's right there. <laughs> it's kind of blurry, but I'll show you. I fed my Old Faithful, fed my starter last night so that it would be, I'd have a lot of it so that I could do some baking and show you guys today. We are going to do some sourdough baking. I'm going to make two artisan loaves. So I'm thinking I will probably do like a blueberry lemon loaf maybe and then a cinnamon raisin loaf. Just some some fun stuff but pretty basic. So anyway I've got lots of starter but it did overflow out of my jar. That's because this is one of my small jars. It's not because I have like the best starter in the world or something. It's just I my big jar is dirty so it's in one of my smaller jars and I fed it too much, so let's clean that up and then we will chat and make some sourdough bread. All right, so in this video, we are going to be primarily talking about maintaining a mature sourdough starter and troubleshooting when things go wrong in the building process or just throughout the time that you have your starter. So if you have not watched my first video in this series, I would recommend watching that first. I will link it up in cards, pop up right here. It is called like the ultimate guide to sourdough starters or something and I walk you through the entire process of making a brand new starter and I actually made four different starters using different kinds of flour just to show you how they performed side by side. So I have had a sourdough starter for about six years and I have seen a lot in those six years. I have learned a lot and one of the things that I have noticed is that a lot of people can really complicate the process of making and using a sourdough starter when it's actually, it's not complicated at all. It really shouldn't be complicated. In fact, um, even the name sourdough starter, it, it's just yeast. It used to just be called yeast. So before isolated commercial yeast, you know, came out on the market, which you can look that up. I actually write all about the history of this in my blog posts on sourdough starters, so those will be linked in the description as well, and I highly recommend checking those out. But before you could go to the store and buy packages of yeast, like that didn't exist. So if you wanted to leaven something, you still used yeast, but you just used homemade yeast, and that's all that sourdough starter is. This is just homemade yeast. Think of it like that. In fact, I wish we could like reclaim that name instead of sourdough starter. Um, just call it homemade yeast because that's what it is and it's the simplest thing in the world to make because there are only two ingredients just flour and water that's all there is to it the process of making a sourdough starter is essentially just combining a little bit of flour and a little bit of water letting it sit at room temperature letting it ferment and capture yeast and bacteria from the grain and from the environment that causes it to become active and bubble up and turn into a leavening agent that can be added into whatever recipe that you're making, whatever bread recipe that you're making that you need to leaven. It takes about a week, usually a little bit longer. I think in my blog post I said like 8 to 12 days is the standard amount of time it takes to make a brand new starter from scratch, meaning that on day one you're starting with an empty jar a little bit of flour and a little bit of water. You're starting totally from scratch. It's gonna take you just a little bit over a week now. A lot of people who are making a brand new starter from scratch actually give up in that first 
week because they get discouraged. Maybe they're not seeing as much activity as they thought, or they see something kind of funny in the jar with the flour and water that they mixed, or they just get freaked out by the whole process, but that is not necessary. So I'm gonna start there. We are going to troubleshoot problems that happen in that first week when you are establishing a brand new starter. And really, I think the most common problem, the most common problem would be that the ratio of flour and water is off. You're feeding too much water, not enough flour, so your sourdough starter is very liquidy after you feed it and stir it. And this problem usually manifests around day four. So what will happen is days one, two, and three will go really well. You mix in, a lot of people do equal parts flour and water. So let's just say you mix like a half cup of flour, half cup of water, stir it up, walk away, 24 hours later you come back and you see some bubbles. And then the same happens the next day and the next day when you do the discarding and feeding process. But then by like day four, you actually stop seeing activity and you start seeing the flour and the water separate in your jar. And if you watched my last video, you'll know that that is called a hooch. So this happens all the time. I get messages all the time saying my starter looked so good in the first couple of days, but now it's like day four, uh, day four, five, six, and I'm not seeing any activity. It's really thin, it's kind of watery. What do I do? So first off, do not throw the starter away and start fresh. Just keep your sourdough starter. What this means is that you actually are building up some cultures inside of that starter jar, which is a really good thing. But that means that those active cultures are eating through, every time you feed the starter, it's eating through the flour really quickly. And there's not enough flour, too much water, so then it just becomes watery and kind of goes dormant. So the solution there is to adjust your ratios. You want your starter to be thick. You do not want it to run off of the end of your spoon. You, you actually want it to be like thick and sticky to where you have to scrape it off of your spoon when you're finished stirring. It should look just like this. Now I know, I know that people out there have all different kinds of, you know, videos on how to make sourdough starter and most people say to feed your starter a one to one ratio, one, you know, one to one flour and water. But I have found that feeding more flour than water gives the best results. So for example, I think in my blog post, uh, my starter recipe calls for a third cup of flour and a quarter cup of water. So you've got more flour than water. But honestly, when I am feeding my starter, I don't measure. I just look for the consistency. And I showed you before, but let's pull it up again. You want your starter to be this consistency. You want it to be really thick. That is the key to keeping it active so that it doesn't get hungry and kind of give up before it has that chance to bubble up and really peak. So this one change honestly fixes probably at least like 75% of the problems that people have when they are getting a brand new starter established. Now, the second mistake that I see happen a lot and it kind of ties in with the first mistake is not discarding enough before you feed the next day or not discarding at all. So this is why I do recommend when you're first getting your starter established to use a small half pint jar. I'll show you something like this. Okay, something small and just using smaller amounts of flour and water you when you're just getting that starter established you don't need a huge volume of flour and water and in fact that's going to make your job so much more difficult because the more flour and water that you use the more you're going to have to feed it the next day the more you're discarding every day just use use the proportions that i <laughs> give in my blog post i like i said i think it's a third cup of flour and a quarter cup of water so that every day when you feed your starter you should have like about this much in your jar it's got plenty of room to bubble up peak and then fall back down before you discard and feed the next day but the second problem i think people are scared to 
discard because they think that more is more, right? They think the more they leave in the jar, the more active their starter will be. The opposite is true. Less is more. Remember that when you are building and maintaining a sourdough starter, less is more. So actually the more you discard, the better because it only takes a teeny tiny little bit. In fact, it, it's called like the scrapings, okay? So you could empty, I could empty, this is active starter right here, it's a full jar. I could empty this entire thing out, but just the little bits that are left, like lining the inside of the jar, would fully activate two, three, four cups of flour and water if I wanted it to. It takes a tiny bit, but the more you leave in there, the more you have to feed it. So people who don't think, oh, I don't want to discard, I, I don't want to waste or whatever, so they leave all of their starter from the previous day in there and then feed just a little bit, you're not feeding it enough. So um, it's hungry and it, it works through the, the little amount of flour that you fed before it really has a time to actually activate and peak. So you're not going to really see a peak and a whole lot of action. So those are the biggest two mistakes. I would say um, the starter is too thin, okay, so too much water, and then not discarding enough. Those two things I really think would fix like all the problems when you're getting a new sourdough starter established. I guess another one, if your house is really, really, really cold, it could take longer than 24 hours for your starter to peak and be ready for the next feeding. Um, but we talked about this in the last video. So if your house is really, really cold, just put it somewhere warm. Put it in like above your um, refrigerator or it's kind of risky to put it in your oven with the light on, <laughs> um, but just a warm place. I have my proofing box, which I absolutely love. I use that all the time. And that is really handy when you're trying to keep the temperature consistent when you're getting a new starter going. All right, another question that I get a lot is just about different types of flour, which I covered this last time. I showed you guys different starters lined up side by side on my blog. I have a blog post on making an einkorn starter, a rye flour starter, and an all purpose starter. Um, you can make a sourdough starter with pretty much any grain really is just up to you. Now you can also use bread flour. A lot of people ask about that because they buy bread flour in bulk for their baking and want to know if they can just use that for their starter. Yes, you can use that and your starter will perform wonderfully. It will probably be very, very active. So that's a great choice. My personal go-to, I feed my starter uh, mostly all purpose and then just a little bit of rye flour. I just love that combination. So every day when I'm feeding my starter, it's a little bit of all purpose flour, a little bit of rye flour. That is what I like. Now, since I mentioned daily feeding, it's probably a good time to talk about storage and what to do with your starter if you're not going to be using it daily. So I don't necessarily use mine daily, but I would say I use it every other day because even if I'm not making bread, um, you know, I've got the kids home with me all day, every day, so I'm making three meals a day. So, every, you know, at least every other day I'm making a big batch of pancakes or sourdough pizza. I'm using my starter for something. So I do store mine at room temperature on the countertop pretty much all the time, unless we are going to be going out of town or something. And then I'll tell you how to store it if you're not going to use it every day. But if your starter is going to be stored at, at room temperature, it does need to be fed every day. So when it's mature, sometimes you can get away with, you know, forgetting about it for a day and feeding it every other day, but it's probably not going to be as strong if you don't maintain that daily feeding schedule. Once your starter is mature, you don't have to discard every day. You can just feed it. Keep in mind, you're going to have to feed it enough to keep the active starter satisfied. So let's just say that I have this jar here right now, okay? Let's say that I used half of this today. So then I've got here that it's half full and I want to feed it again. If I feed a jar of active starter that is halfway full, just like a quarter cup of flour and you know a quarter cup of water, that is not going to satisfy that starter. It's probably not going to rise up and peak. There'll be some action, but it's not going to really bubble up and double and peak like this did because I didn't feed it enough. There was a lot more active starter than what I fed it. So that is one reason I caution against keeping a massive sourdough starter in like a huge jar. Like if you're not doing a ton 
a ton of baking, then you just have a lot of starter. You're going to end up wasting a lot of flour and water because you're going to have to be discarding regularly and it's just not sustainable. You really want to be thinking ahead most times to how much starter you're going to be using within the next day or two and just have that much active starter ready because it really is best to pretty much almost empty your jar when you're making whatever you're making and then feed that empty jar that's just lined with the scrapings. Like I said, less is more. I actually just transferred a little bit. This was a clean jar last time when I fed it. I transferred, you can see behind me, my big starter there. Um, I just wanted it in a clean jar today because I knew I was filming this video. That's why I did this. But I, I put maybe a tablespoon of active starter in here and then fed it maybe a cup of flour and three quarters cup of water. And this is what I got from just that little bitty tablespoon of active sourdough starter. So don't keep more than you're going to use. Like I said, less is more. Now, if you are not going to be using your starter every day or every other day, it is best to kind of set like a baking schedule and then store it in the refrigerator. Because when you store your starter in the fridge, the cooler temperature slows down the activity, almost stops all of the fermentation activity so that your starter kind of lies dormant, but you know, it doesn't go bad or anything. You're not going to ruin it. And in fact, you can store it in the fridge without feeding it for like two weeks, two to three weeks. I know I've had one in there for longer when we went out of town and I just took, you know, I didn't get it out right away and, and revive it. So it was in there for quite a while, but a sourdough starter that has a tight fitting, like airtight lid on it stored in the fridge will keep for several weeks with no feeding. That means you don't touch it. You put the lid on, put it in the fridge, put it in the back corner of your fridge and just forget about it until you're ready to use it again to bake. This is absolutely the most practical way to go for most people because most people just don't need to bake that much. And like I said, it's a really simple process. Just take your starter jar, put an airtight lid on it, put it in the fridge and forget about it. And then you do want to get it out of the fridge like at least 24 hours before you're going to use it again because you, it needs time to warm up and wake up. You need to feed it so that it will peak and be ready to use again. So let's just say that I was going to pick Saturday mornings as my weekly sourdough baking day. I would probably get my starter out on Friday morning and I would feed it let it sit, and then by Saturday morning, it would be bubbled up, peaked, ready to go. I would bake whatever I was going to bake and take it down to like the scrapings of the jar and then put it back in the fridge. And that's another thing. I personally, when I store my starter in the fridge, I don't store like a full whole jar like this. I store basically like an empty jar that just has <laughs> the scrapings inside, maybe like a half an inch or an inch of active starter at the bottom. So you only need a little bit to store it in the fridge. And I know a ton of people do it this way, especially people who work through the week. It's just really not feasible to maintain a sourdough starter and a sourdough baking schedule. If you're at work all day, then they just do like a Saturday um, baking day and that's what they do. They get their starter out before work on Friday morning, feed it, let it sit, it's ready to go Saturday morning, use it, put a lid on, put it back, repeat the next week. All right, I'm actually looking through the blog post that I have because it is so detailed and it's much more, I'm a better writer than I am a speaker. I'm not good at articulating things when I'm talking into the camera, at least I don't think I am, but usually when I'm actually writing things down, it turns out pretty good. So <laughs> truly go see the blog post if you are still confused or if you have questions because I think it's really laid out very clearly in this blog post, I have a maintenance section. I don't know if you guys can see this, but I have a maintenance section, a frequently asked questions. I give tips, troubleshooting, storage, just everything is in here. So go check out the blog post. Before we get to baking our loaves today, just a few things that I, I don't remember if I mentioned in the last video, but they're worth repeating you do not have to put your starter in a clean jar every day when you discard and feed just use the same jar now for whatever reason you start to see like molds build up around the outside of your jar then yes put it in a new jar and that's another I'm glad i brought that up okay so if you see mold in your starter jar 
do not throw the starter away. The whole starter is not ruined. It's just, you just need a new jar. So if your jar is just moldy or, or dirty or, you know, it's time to change it out, just take a spoon and scoop out a little bit of clean starter. Put it in the next jar, in the clean jar, and then wash the old one and you're good to go. Okay, let's talk about hydration really quickly. So once your starter is mature, it's established and it's really robust and I mean, that thing is like impossible to kill. That's how mine is now. You guys saw in my last video that I, I baked it in the oven on accident and it still didn't die, which is, is just amazing. Then once your starter is mature, you can start playing around with hydration. Now, this is another thing that people complicate, but it's not complicated. Complicated at all. Just think about what is hydration. Like when you're hydrated, that means that you're drinking more water. Okay, you're full of more more water. When you're not hydrated, then, then you you're not drinking as much water. It just has to do with the amount, the water content in your starter. Like that's all it is. So I know I really dumbed that down there. Probably sounded very stupid, but. That is all it is because I, I, I feel like, you know, people start throwing out percentages and make it like a math equation when it, it really doesn't have to be that way. So once your starter is mature, you want to start baking more things. You might find certain recipes call for a high hydration starter or um, a fully hydrated starter. Um, some call for a low hydration starter. All that means, it, it's just talking about the water content. That's all. So a high hydration starter has more water. Um, it's probably more like a one-to-one -one water and flour. So this is a thinner starter. And since it is mature and robust, um, it will rise up and peak really quickly before it gets hungry. So it can work to do that one-to-one -one ratio when down the line, when your starter is mature. So I can tell you like my starter <laughs> that I have, um, if the house is warm or if I have it in a warm place, it will peak within like three to four hours. It is truly just amazing. Now, if I let it sit for a few days, forget to feed it, or it's really cold, it can take like the full 12 to 24 hours. But in the right conditions, a mature starter can peak very quickly. And that's how you can make it work with higher hydration. And I, I hope this is all making sense. Okay, last thing before we start baking. On my last video, I used the same spoon to stir all of the different experimental sourdough starters that I was making. And one of them was my Old Faithful that had been, I revived over a few days after baking it. So I did get questions saying, what about cross-contamination? And yeah, there probably was, there was cross-contamination because you have to remember what a sourdough starter is. Um, a starter is capturing yeast and bacteria from the environment. So if you have an active starter in your kitchen, then it's going to be easier to start a new one because you've already got lots of active yeast. So you see me getting ready here to film my, uh, you know, making my artisan bread and got to pull up the old maternity genes. Oh man, joys of pregnancy, huh? I actually love being pregnant. I do, but <laughs> sometimes just 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 rough ladies but anyway um so yeah there was probably a little cross contamination from this using the same spoon when i was doing my other starters but that would have happened anyway because my house is used to having a sourdough starter so let's move on and let's get to baking these artisan loaves with a little bit of a twist like i said today i'm going to do a blueberry lemon loaf and a cinnamon raisin swirl loaf so both kind of sweet loaves but I know exactly what I'm going to use them for. Um, these will be perfect for toast and French toast for breakfast for the week. So as I mentioned, I am making two loaves. So I'm making a double batch of my artisan bread recipe and just going to add some add-ins. I do have my sourdough artisan bread recipe on my blog. Finally, it's up on my blog. So all the detailed instructions are there. And it is a beginner's recipe. So I mean, I write everything out just to make it so simple step by step. I also have a video on making just plain old artisan bread. Um, so I'll, I'll link that in the description too. So you can see here that I'm just saving a teeny tiny little bit of my starter out of that dirty jar. Um, I'll feed this and it will bubble right on up by tomorrow. So really less is more. That little bit of starter I'm feeding like a whole cup of flour. So, you know, I do my mix of all purpose and rye flour, 
add in some water, stir it together, set it to the side, and it is good to go. As we discussed before, you really want your starter to be thick. I like a really thick consistency for most recipes. Um, and also don't be afraid to touch your starter. Don't be a germaphobe. As long as your hands are clean, you know, go ahead and scrape the spoon off. It'll be just fine. It's actually good for the starter. So let's get back to our bread baking. My base artisan bread recipe is something like a cup and a half of water, one cup of active starter, and three cups of flour-ish. Like I said, I, I look for the consistency of the dough um, that might change depending on how much active starter I actually have and you'll see here how much just how powerful an active starter is because I only had one cup of active sourdough starter and I'm going to use that to make two loaves even though uh, my recipe calls for one cup for each loaf that one cup of starter because my starter is so mature it will work its way through enough flour and water for me to make two loaves it'll be just fine um and it probably you know my starter is just very well established so it probably won't take longer than usual either now i have to transfer into a bigger container because i kind of um misjudged here i thought i could fit all my ingredients into my usual glass container here but since i doubled the recipe we need to go into the big baking bucket. These plastic baking buckets are really great if you do a lot of bulk baking. Um, professional bakers use these and that's actually a video I want to make sometime. I'll probably make that soon. Like if I were going to be a professional sourdough baker, uh, let me show you my process. Let me break down the cost for expenses and show you like what I would profit and maybe I'll actually do it and bake all those loaves and then just sell them to people locally and tell you how much money I made. I think that would be really fun. I don't want to do it for real, but just kind of an experiment because it would be a really good side gig if you get really good at sourdough baking. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm in some sourdough groups and I, I see that ladies actually um, can profit quite a bit. So you see there, I just mixed together my water, my sourdough starter, and my flour until I got kind of a shaggy um, mixture you're not needing. When you make artisan bread, it is a no need bread. No kneading. You just stir everything together. Um, I'm using my proofing bucket here, or proofing bucket, <laughs> proofing box here to control the temperature because it's so cold in my house right now. So I let that dough rest for a half an hour. Then I added in my salt. I add a tablespoon of salt per loaf. So I added two tablespoons to this dough. That initial half hour rest before adding the salt really just allows the um, flour to absorb all the water and I, I like doing it that way. <laughs> so I added my salt, kind of mixed it in with my hands, once again, not kneading, put it back in the proofing box, let it rest for 30 minutes, and then I took it out and now I'm doing my first stretch and fold. So when you stretch and fold, you just grab the edge of the dough and pull it up, stretch it, and fold it over and I did a series of three stretch and folds and then I let my dough bulk ferment for a couple hours and look at this this dough has definitely doubled in size maybe even more than doubled in size so that's that's good it's very very active that one cup of sourdough starter worked its way through enough to make two big loaves of bread so it's worth it stick with it to get your sourdough starter to be active and mature and uh, you know, you can just work magic with, with those things. So I'm preparing my blueberry lemon mixture here for my um, for that particular loaf. So what I do is I add like a tablespoon of flour to a bowl and then a cup of frozen blueberries and zest from one whole lemon. And you, maybe you're wondering like, can you really taste that lemon zest in a whole loaf of bread? Yes, you really can. Um, and it's one of my favorites. So coating the blueberries and lemon zest and flour helps prevent bleeding. So it makes just a really pretty, pretty loaf that isn't streaked. Um, so that's why I do that. So I just tossed the blueberries and lemon zest in flour, set it to the side. Now I cut my big lump of dough into half since I'm making two loaves. I am stretching it out. This is how I shape my dough. This is the next step after your bulk fermentation, which bulk fermentation is just a fancy term for letting the dough rise um, and double in size. So then I stretch it out in a rectangle, kind of like when you're making cinnamon rolls. So you're probably all familiar with that. And then at this point, if I didn't have any add-ins, I would just shape it, but I do have add-ins. So I'm adding 
most of my blueberry lemon zest mixture here, gonna press it in and kind of do like a tri-fold of my dough. Um, just folding it over lengthwise. And then I'm gonna flatten it out and I'm gonna add another layer of blueberry lemon. This is really important when you're adding add-ins to add a few layers. Otherwise, all of the add-ins will be like around the edge of your loaf. And you'll see, I, I actually did that in the next loaf. I'm, so you'll get to see what that looks like. You'll see the difference if you do this extra step. See, I'm adding it, now that I folded the dough over, I'm adding another layer of blueberry lemon zest. And then I'm gonna roll this up. And this loaf is going to just be so much prettier and have such a better distribution of the add-ins than the next loaf you will see me make. So this was a good experiment for you guys. So this is how I shape my loaves. I kind of roll them up and then just kind of tuck the ends under, give them a little dusting of flour, and so just so they don't stick to the banneton basket. And then, you know, you don't have to have banneton proofing baskets. I have all this stuff linked. I had to have all my sourdough supplies linked in the description for you guys. It's all on my Amazon storefront. It's all linked in the blog post. But you can make do with whatever you have. If all you have is your mixing bowl, just line your mixing bowl with a towel and flip your ball of dough over into the mixing bowl. That's just fine. You don't need a bunch of fancy stuff. But, you know, if you're going to be doing this regularly, it's fun to have all, all the good stuff. Um, so just going to cover this with plastic and work on shaping my next loaf. So this next loaf is going to be a cinnamon raisin swirl loaf. And I'm going to show you the difference when you just do the add-ins on the initial shaping step, but you don't do add-ins after you start folding. You'll see what I'm saying, like once I go to, go to cut these loaves. So I, for this recipe, I just maybe like a half cup of brown sugar, spread that out. Like it, it's so similar to making cinnamon rolls. You're just not adding the butter. Um, sprinkle with maybe a tablespoon of cinnamon, add like a cup of three quarters cup of raisins probably. And then right there is when I should have stopped and added another layer of the brown sugar, cinnamon, and raisins. So I'm gonna show you, you will see a big difference. I'm shaping this, this dough just like I shaped the other loaf. I'm gonna uh, tuck the ends in and kind of swirl it around to create some surface tension, coat it with flour, flip it over into my basket cover, and these are going to proof in the fridge overnight. Now, if this seems like such a long process and you're wondering how do I get the timing right? I actually, in my um, beginner's guide to baking artisan bread, I have two sample baking schedules. One for evening, afternoon or evening baking and one for morning baking. So check that out if this seems like a lot because I break it down and give you like a minute by minute schedule of how you could do this. So let's fast forward to the next morning. My Loaves have been proofing in the fridge all night. I'm ready to bake. So the first thing I'm going to do is preheat my bread oven. So you don't need bread ovens. You can use Dutch oven. A Dutch oven, you can use the crock from your crock pot with a lid, but preheat it in the oven at 425 for at least a half an hour. You want your Dutch oven or bread oven to be very, very hot. Now, once they've been preheating for a half an hour, like wait to the last minute, leave your loaves in the fridge to the last minute, and then get them out and prepare them to bake by scoring them. So I turn my loaves out onto parchment paper and give them just a little dusting of flour. I think it makes for a pretty loaf when it comes out of the oven and it's got a fresh flour dusting. And then I score. I'm not doing anything really artistic with scoring today. Number one, because I'm not artistic as a person. Number two, because I wanna keep this simple for you guys. I think people can just get freaked out when you add a lot of extra steps. So I'm turning both of my loaves out and gonna just do the same thing. <laughs> I'm gonna do the flour dusting do the big expansion scores. And the expansion scores are important. You really do need to do these. Otherwise your loaf will end up cracking and might be misshapen. It might not have good oven spring, which means the shape won't be good. And then the crumb won't be good. And the crumb, that terminology there, the crumb just means um, like what the bread looks like, what the texture of the bread is when you slice it. So we'll talk a little bit about more more about that in just a second, but let's bake these loaves. So now that I've got them scored with, I just did three big expansion scores. Um, my bread ovens are preheated. I am going to set these loaves in my bread ovens on the parchment paper. Now, if you want, 
you can use steam while you are baking your loaves. I have all these notes in my um, oh blog post. So you could put like a pan with water in the bottom of your oven and that will create steam in the oven and give you a um, softer crust. But I'm not going to do that today. We're just going to stick with the basics. So I'm going to bake these loaves with the lid on for 30 minutes at 425. You might have to experiment with that temperature and time depending on your altitude or your particular oven, but this works for me. So after 30 minutes, I'm gonna take the lid off, bake for another eight to 10 minutes, just keeping an eye on the crust until it is golden brown, and then I will take my loaves out and look at those beauties. They are just perfect. They've got the perfect shape, um, perfect texture. The scores turned out great but I'm not ready to cut into these. So one of the keys to a really good artisan loaf is letting it cool. You have to be patient. The one exception is if you're going to be eating it, the whole loaf right away, like, you know, making French toast or grilled cheese right away, then you can cut into it. But once you cut into that loaf, then the steam and the moisture all escapes and um, it loses its moisture and it becomes dry and gummy. And it's, it's pretty much ruined, to be honest. So I actually let those loaves set for a whole 24 hours on the counter, just like you saw them. We're fast forwarding into the next morning, and now I'm making French toast. So I'm going to cut a few slices from each loaf and... make us a delicious breakfast with our artisan loaves. And yes, I have lots of help here, little hands reaching <laughs> into my egg mixture. Okay, first up is our blueberry lemon loaf. Now remember, I did two layers of blueberry lemon zest. I did the first layer when I was shaping, folded the dough over and then did another layer and look how beautiful this turned out with such an even distribution of blueberries and lemons. So if I was a professional sourdough baker, this is what I would want. I would want my clients to cut into this loaf and see this, a very nice even distribution of the toppings. That is exactly what you're going for. And I've got a nice closed, fully proofed crumb. I've got definitely some good air bubbles going on there, but it's not a huge open crumb. I actually prefer somewhat of a closed crumb, but we'll talk about crumb in another video. I've talked about it before. I've actually shown you guys how to do an open crumb versus a closed crumb, but let's move on because now I'm cutting into my cinnamon raisin swirl loaf that's not going to be swirled because this is what happens when you only do one layer of add-ins on the initial shaping step. So this loaf was still delicious. The crumb is still perfect. It turned out great, but look, I all of my cinnamon raisin is consolidated kind of like around the edges it's not spread out so if I was selling making these loaves to sell um, my client would be pretty clients would be pretty disappointed I love how I have like these imaginary clients in my head that buy sourdough from me but they would be disappointed they would want to see more uh, more cowbell no not more cowbell but they would want to see more cinnamon raisins spread out throughout the loaf so that's just a little lesson there for you guys. I was willing to sacrifice that loaf to show you this. Um, now let's move on. <laughs> so I just whipped up some eggs, milk, and vanilla. Gonna You all know how to make French toast, I'm sure. Um, dip my artisan bread in there and use my old faithful. This cast iron griddle is actually not part of my stove. It sits on my stovetop, and it is one of my most used things in the kitchen it, it doesn't leave like I could easily put it away but I pretty much use it every day for something making pancakes or french toast or grilled cheese or grilling something and it's actually reversible so it's got a griddle and a grill side I'll link this griddle for you guys I need to figure out you can like link stuff to where it pops up on the screen when I'm talking about it I just haven't looked into that yet but <laughs> maybe I'll figure that out if not it's in the description so got my French toast done here I'm just going to plate up some of this and make it look pretty take pictures for the blog and then I'm gonna eat with my children because this looks so delicious and um, I always have like eager little people standing behind me when I am making food for the blog and 
taking pictures and like, ooh, ooh, is it ready yet? Is it ready yet? So we are almost ready. Just topping it with some butter and some maple syrup, a little dusting of powdered sugar for pizzazz. That'll make it look pretty, pretty pictures. And there we go. All right. Well, thank you guys for tuning in. Please leave any questions you have. If there was something that I didn't address, you still have questions after watching this video, drop them in the comment section and I will try to get to as many as possible. Otherwise, check out the blog posts and the other videos that I link because I have lots of sourdough resources. All right. Well, thank you for watching and I will see you next week.